We'll move now to um, Mark Brown and the, the particular question he's been asked to respond to is um, developing a shared vision and goals for digital learning nationally. Is this a realistic aspiration and or how might it be approached? Mark. Well, thank you, Jim. And um, I too was feeling rather intimidated in front of this audience and those online before Larry got up, but now I'm feeling even more intimidated <laughs> because I have no prompts, no tea tree oil, no batteries. I can see next time I'm going to have to come more prepared. Um, I'd like to just start by thanking you for the opportunity, particularly thanking the National Forum for the opportunity to contribute to today's panel discussion because I really think that this type of event is precisely the type of initiative that's required to help build a stronger sense of vision for digital learning in Irish higher education. By way of a bit more background to the report, um, and Jim, thankfully you didn't entirely steal my thunder, it's useful, I think, to anchor this discussion in um, some of the key observations, or just a single key observation, from the Strategic and Leadership Perspectives report that Jim produced. Based on the compact analysis, or the analysis of the compact um, agreements, the report in particular concludes, quote, the overall pattern is something of a patchwork that does not present a picture of higher education, of a higher education sector, with a shared understanding <coughs> or cohesive vision for capacity, um, digital capacity, I guess. Uh, one subtle point, an important one nonetheless, is digital capacity, or in this context, capacity is not the same as digital learning. And I think we need to kind of just uncouple that a little bit and get our heads around it. Nonetheless, the report also makes the point that there is confusion, and Jim referred to this, around terminology. Developing a shared vision is always going to be somewhat problematic when there is no agreed definition or understanding in policy, but more importantly even in practice, of what we mean by digital, flexible, blended, e-learning, so on and so forth. So I think although the terms are always multifaceted and sometimes there's a tendency to be far too simpl simplistic in our thinking, they're certainly not single entities when we're referring to digital learning. Um, it's something that we do need to address, if only because of the pressure to be uh, more accurate in the reporting and our monitoring and measuring of progress. So my first key point really follows on, and I've got three points probably I really want to make. The first key point follows on from what I've just said, as I think the extent that we place a focus on digital learning as opposed to teaching and learning per se, still needs to be open for some debate. And in some respects, we've kind of already talked about this in talking about how the digital, the technology enhanced learning, note how we've already used different language, is subservient to the goals that we're trying to achieve for teaching and learning. They serve those goals. So I guess, is digital learning the end game or merely a key vehicle in achieving a much bigger vision? I think, as I said, we should leave it open for debate, give ourselves the option of rather than just singling out the benefits of a specific digital focus, to allow us to look at the opportunities and potentially the advantages of longer term focusing on teaching and learning per se, may actually outweigh the um, disadvantages or potentially the advantages of the digital focus that we currently have. Maybe a short-term focus for a longer-term goal. Would we benefit then from shifting the current focus away from the language of digital learning in the near future, in the foreseeable future, to an emphasis on a developing a vision for our preferred learning futures? And I, I quite like this notion of learning futures, or probably my preference is actually education futures, to locate our um, vision building process in the futures that we have available to us. So in many respects the guiding question that I was given and you've got before you could be rephrased, how do we develop a shared vision and goals for the future of teaching and learning nationally? Hope that's not too kind of um, trivial. In many respects, in doing a little bit of investigation and homework for this panel, you could argue that a future focused vision for higher education in Ireland, which subsumes learning and teaching, actually already exists. 
the National Strategy for Higher Education, the Hunt Report, states, and I'll just remind you, quote, in the decades ahead, higher education will play a central role in making Ireland a country recognised for innovation, competitive enterprise, and continuing academic excellence, and an attractive place to live and work cultural, with cultural vibrancy and inclusive social structures. In my view, that kind of statement really meets the criteria or the definition of the vision as it sets out our aspirations for the future. In, a, in many respects, it offers a sense of where we want to go in the future, with or without digital learning, and with a moral purpose, which is an important trait of visions, good visions. Any vision for digital learning, or as I used before, the term education futures, and the related goals would, I think, benefit from being really tightly philosophically grounded within and aligned with the type of vision I've just already stated that exists for us. I think it's quite a good beacon. Of course, Jim alluded to this, under such a vision, one of the goals that we would set would be to develop a more inclusive funding model that increases flexible access to higher education for all, which digital learning now makes possible and observed by the report on the modernisation of European universities, one of the key points that report makes. At the same time, um, this point really highlights that vision without adequate funding is always going to be problematic. There's no point having visions, aspirations, that don't match the kind of environment that we're in. My second key point is really, I think that the current discourse around vision needs to shift from the reactive language of education in change, and dare I say, even the language of the need for a step change, to more proactive debate, to more proactive discussion about higher education for change. Adopting a wider perspective that I'm advocating, anchored in the language of societal inclusion, and the changes actually that we're seeking to achieve, and I've cited just one example, but I've happened to think it's a good example from the Hunt Report, and the changes that we're trying to achieve may help to overcome the problem that in many respects, history teaches us that visions can be blinding, often are framed overly narrowly, and potentially hide competing change forces. Similar people use the language of the visions for different ends. And history is actually littered with, um, over the ages, people who have been, had quite dangerous and morally corrupt visions, which naively many of us have followed. I won't name individuals, but um, Europe has a long history in actual fact of this. I think it's important to acknowledge that the digital roadmap phase one rightly acknowledges that digital learning is not benign. Some of the visions for the future present, being presented to us by others, not necessarily by educators within the sector, are infused with the language of globalisation, neoliberal policies, and the increasing commercialisation of higher education. These are all things that we have to confront, maybe reasons why we need a vision. This point recognises the debate in the educational change literature about the role that visions play or not in successfully implementing complex change. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the um, conventional change models advocated by people like Cotter, who promote vision building as one of the first steps in bringing about large-scale complex organisational change. In contrast, I'm sure there are many of you also familiar with the work of people like Michael Fulham, who argues that vision and strategic planning come later. It is what you end with rather than what you start with. Put simply, you cannot mandate, you cannot mandate what matters. Or to quote Professor Jeff Scott from Australia, who I'd advocate that you look at some of his work, change is learning and learning is change. Change is complex, change is process, and change is a journey, not a blueprint. So any efforts to develop a shared vision for digital learning or our education futures need to be mindful of the importance of the journey. And this is part of that journey. My third key point is really that there's an important difference to be made here between macro-level visions and defining an institutional-level mission. 
I don't want to argue too much about what a word means, and a word will mean what it means to you, but for me, vision is a process of identifying what matters most to people, making our choices explicit, and stating our preferred futures. Vision is, uh, sorry, mission as opposed to what I've described for vision is about actually how we get there. And so in a complex and diverse sector, each third level institution is likely to have quite a different mission. I don't find this at all surprising in terms of Jim's analysis of the um, <coughs> agreements, the compact agreements. After all, your mission is inextricably going to be linked to your institutional culture and the goals that you set for serving your respective communities. And in fact, the digital roadmap phase one noted that very point. Quote, each institution must define its own path in this new and complex context. <coughs> Unquote. So there is no single path. At the same time, that's not a cop out to say that there is no way in which we can provide pathways. How you define and implement your mission within our overarching vision is really important. And I'm sure there are many of you in the room that have much more experience than I have at institutional level in doing this, but the mission needs to bring people with you. It also needs to value resistance as a real source of insight. And the truth is, in the case of digital learning, we haven't got all the people with us. There's lots of resistance. Resistance because of academic workload, resistance because of lack of funding and resources and so on. These are all issues that we should turn as a strength to help vision and imagining and building rather than see as barriers. We also need to recognise the creative tension that exists between bottom-up and top-down approaches, or even the middle out if you want to find some middle ground. Neither centralisation nor decentralisation works. We know this from the literature as individual learning and organisational learning at whatever level are inextricably linked. So from this type of perspective about change, complex change in large organisations and in large systems, every person is a change agent. It follows that we must not underestimate the importance of building, articulating and influencing personal visions, because ultimately people make change happen. In conclusion, Jim, you talked about um, adopting the metaphor of an atlas rather than a road map, and I, I find that quite interesting. In many respects, just kind of borrowing the metaphor and in danger of extending it beyond the point of having any substance, I do see the challenges facing us more akin to steering a pathway through uncharted frontiers where there is no complete road map, no real well-developed atlas of the digital cosmos. What we really need is more a compass, a set of optical tools, and the right kind of new vehicles to help us see and explore current practices and future possibilities. Getting lost along the way may actually be a valuable part of the journey, which contributes to new knowledge. Evidence may actually come out of that journey. So with this point in mind, I think envisaging our education futures will always be a work in progress as the future remains on the horizon. And this is a very important thing, that I th uh, thing I think that the policy landscape needs to recognise. This is never going to be done. It is a conversation that continues. Lastly, I was asked to offer something concrete, um, mindful that I wanted to throw some ideas out there and um, it'd be interesting to get some reflection at some point. But I um, want to give you three concrete things that perhaps academics are not always good at doing. Um, that would help build a more future-focused, digitally-enabled higher education sector that has a sense of vision. Um, the suggestions build on my metaphor of a digital compass as the initiatives we undertake are not framed to manage digital innovations, but rather help steer pathways and promote conversations towards more digitally creative and innovative institutions, teachers and learners. So very briefly, the first initiative that I think would have some value is developing a set of national guidelines for digital learning. Um, we may want to argue about language, but the point of this is as an inclusive process to engage in a common language, not to provide a robust and um, constraining framework, 
especially where there's such a framework already exists with quality assurance um, standards, but a common language for discussion and decision making, an enabling process. So in many respects, the process is more important than the outcome. In fact, the guidelines would need to be completely revised on a regular basis. Secondly, to develop a national benchmarking toolkit for digital learning. We need to understand from a systems approach that the sum of the whole is greater than the individual parts. Um, there are a number of existing toolkits already available, but it, we shouldn't borrow from other cultures and contexts. We need something unique for the Irish sector, with a very strong focus, as distinct to quality assurance, on quality enhancement. And then lastly, probably more um, something that I'm passionate about in light of vision, and I really am passionate about vision and our education futures, is a, the importance of developing toolkits for different education scenarios, a planning toolkit for education scenarios, a tool for planning for uncertain times, uncertain futures, to help articulate the options available to us and to help mature our thinking about what might be our preferred futures. There are opportunities for all of those things, but at the same time, resourcing also has to be matched with reality. Thank you.